for your interests. It's always wonderful for me, uh, someone who's interested in the phenomenon of viewpoint diversity um, and how to cooperate a across uh, different perspectives <clears throat> to uh, work with people, to talk to people that have very different backgrounds uh, from mine. Um, to some extent, uh, political philosophy as a profession is kind of, not, they're kind, we're kind of knowledge hoarders. Uh, we pretty much only distribute that knowledge to the next generation of philosophers. Um, yes, we teach some undergraduate courses, so people sort of pick these things up, but in terms of you know, really communicating new insights and ideas, um, this is not something we often have an opportunity uh, to do, and we don't pursue enough. So again, thank you for coming, and I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation. So today we're talking about this ideal of credible neutrality, um, <clears throat> and I think you know pretty important um, when it comes to designing. Uh, <clears throat> forgive me, when it comes to designing uh, decision making processes in firms or DAOs or things like that. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to explain some of the ideal, raise some problems with it, um, talk a little bit about the connections between, maybe a good bit, about the connections between credible neutrality and then the idea of what we call liberal neutrality uh, in the field of uh, political philosophy, which is roughly this idea that states should not take sides on moral and religious questions that are a matter of reasonable dispute. Of course, there's a lot to, to challenge in that idea. There's a lot that's packed in, um, but hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about it a little bit. So let me begin with some cases in the kind of uh, tech space that where I think companies may uh, have made some errors. <clears throat> and this is a very specific one. So um, in 2021, Amazon decided not to sell this book when Harry became Sally. Um, it makes it just a, a sort of mainline conservative case against sort of various uh, pro-transgender uh, positions. So this isn't, you know, someone who's particularly extreme. The author, Ryan Anderson, is just a very mainline um, <coughs> conservative, giving kind of mainline conservative views on these issues that, um, however much you may disagree, of course, are, are the standard view within basically all the major world religions uh, currently. Um, that can change. It can change quickly. Um, <clears throat> but the point is, there was nothing especially out of the ordinary about this book. And it became a total mystery why Amazon decided not to sell it. In fact, it became such a big deal that a variety of GOP senators began to directly challenge Amazon, I think in part because they didn't want their own books removed. Um, <clears throat> and curiously, when, when there are usually complaints of this sort, many times companies will just relent. Um, but Amazon actually dug in. They said that they're, they cho have chosen not to sell books that treat transgenderism as a, quote, mental disorder. Now, the book itself doesn't actually do this. Um, <coughs> again, as, as far as these um, things in the world of ideas go, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty boring in terms of the things that it has out there. For instance, um, it's, of course, still the overwhelming majority position uh, within the country that... Um, um, there should be, say, re legal restrictions on transition surgeries among uh, adolescents. Um, so again, not to get us caught up in this particular issue, but just to give a very, very vivid example where what Amazon did is they singled out a particular book and a particular author, whether they intended to do so initially, while selling other books that are way more terrible for just to give an obvious example, they continue to sell all kinds of uh, anti-Semitic books, including Mein Kampf. Um, and so one of the ways that it looks like Amazon violated the doctrine of credible neutrality is they kind of picked a particular target. And in general, you want very general rules um, that enable you to treat everyone the same, right? Because again, that's part of not selecting or particular picking a particular person. So this was a case, I think, where Amazon... I don't know the real story about what happened behind the scenes, um, who decided to not sell this, but they dug in. And so you may think that, you know, this was a failure of credible neutrality, even if you think that maybe Amazon made uh, the right call. Let me give you a broader example where I think Twitter failed at credible neutrality. So obviously um, the cases that we hear about most when Twitter bans or perm bans a person is it's usually a prominent American conservative or uh, Jordan Peterson, who's Canadian. Um, and in many cases, 
um, they'll use their Twitter accounts to sort of go right up to the edge of what uh, Twitter is willing to tolerate. And then if Twitter bans them, then, <clears throat> you know, their complaints are, are something along those lines about Twitter not being fair. Now, sometimes people are being directly, uh, deliberately uh, provocative. Um, <clears throat> but the terms of service, and I think this is a very interesting thing, also include uh, stopping violations of, of very new norms, such as not dead naming transgender persons. Now, this is a very important norm. Okay, you know, I have uh, two trans uh, transgender graduate students, um, and the following these norms is very important to them uh, to feel respected and included. But the problem is that to most of the world, this is they never heard of this before. And so, for instance, when Jordan Peterson dead named Elliot Page, this led uh, Twitter to ban him until he deleted the tweet and he refused uh, to do so. Now, I'm not saying Twitter shouldn't include these new norms in its terms of service, though, of course, I think it's important for companies if they're going to uh, have new norms, if they're going to impose new norms, that they do more to kind of explain their position, um, particularly users all over the world um, that may have different moral views, <clears throat> different ways of thinking about sexual orientation and gender identity than the people that uh, operate Twitter. But at the same time, Twitter allows Chinese Communist Party media, just total propaganda outlets. And then, of course, the Chinese taking accounts that deny uh, the current uh, Uyghur uh, genocide. Um, there's all kinds of genocide denialism. And, you know, whatever you think about the dead naming norm, and, you know, this is a, a norm that I think, again, is very important uh, to make sure that my transgender students are respected and included. Um, Arguably, genocide denial is pretty high up in the list of things that you would kind of want to avoid. Um, and so it looks like Twitter targets um, individuals that are also Americans um, or close and uh, um, are kind of Twitter, Twitter uh, owners and operators out group, right? Now, actually... It's turned out that Jack has said various pro uh, free speech things. Um, but if you think about the choices that Twitter has made, um, it looks like Twitter's placing more demanding standards on policing groups that are, in fact, their political opponents than genuinely authoritarian and dangerous regimes. And of course, this has been a kind of a disaster for Twitter, right? Because this is one of the things that led Elon Musk to make the bid that he made was the perception that Twitter was not credibly neutral. And I think we can all agree that Twitter's actually really dropped the ball in terms of the idea of credible neutrality. Now, maybe they don't accept it, but the point is, this is a way that things can go wrong very, very badly. With Amazon, it's a very specific, vivid case that affected them really not at all. Um, but, but Twitter's um, uh, sort of seemingly, right, apparently um, uh, uneven enforcement of uh, plausible terms of service um, has actually damaged the company uh, an enormous amount. Um, well, so, okay, so let's, so we've got an idea of what a credibly neutral violation would look like. So let's back up and think philosophically about what's really going on, what this idea of credible neutrality uh, comes from, how it originates. So, so the, um, the point of credible neutrality generally is that companies need widespread confidence in their operations in order to flourish. And companies or DAOs, whatever the group is, that become politically coded, particularly in our polarized culture, blue coded, um, can garner bad publicity and lose business by losing the confidence of much of the U.S. and, of course, uh, much of the world, which in generally is much more, the, the average human is more uh, socially conservative than the average uh, American. So the point of credible neutrality is to maintain trust in systems that govern the digital and non-digital lives of most of the human race. But there's also this goal, there's a moral goal, it's not just to maintain trust in systems, but to preserve <clears throat> values um, that these organizations and companies embrace, such as freedom and equality, right? You want people to be free to uh, express themselves, but you also want to treat people equally. Now, it turns out that credibly neutral procedures are ancient. It, it, it's, it's not as if we just started talking about them a few decades ago. They begin with the old and typically Roman ideal of the rule of law. 
where people are treated as equal before the law, regardless of their morally arbitrary characteristics like race and like class. This also extends, of course, into the Hebrew Bible, where there are cases where judges are not supposed to accept bribes, which would lead them to yield different judgments depending on whether someone was rich or poor. So the idea of equal treatment across different groups is not new at all. And the idea of procedures, particularly legal procedures, being neutral between different kinds of characteristics is also very important. Now, the list of characteristics that were considered arbitrary, right, like race or class differences, rapidly expanded starting in the 17th century. And what was once what we call Latin Christendom, of course, you recall the Roman Empire split. It developed into a kind of Greek speaking half and a Latin speaking half. What was unique about the Latin, Latin Christendom was not just widespread commitment to uh, arguably Roman Catholic Christianity, um, but also the phenomenon of having very weak nation states, but also a very strong church that had managed to kind of colonize and reuse much of the state capacity of the Roman Empire at that time. And so you had an extremely powerful religious organization um, that could credibly crown and uncrown monarchs in many cases. This is in many ways an unheard of and unrepeated uh, institutional arrangement. Um, and it led to... Um, the need to religiously legitimate the power of the Pope, given that, for instance, the Pope and his bishops uh, generally did not have much by way of uh, military. Um, and so even though actually the Pope governed the papal states, so was a kind of Italian sovereign for a time, a long time, <clears throat> you had this overarching kind of religious agreement. Um, but of course, when the Protestant Reformation arose in response to this, you saw enormous Christian infighting. And for centuries, you have this, this fighting, but you also have peace or peace agreements where, say, the Peace of Westphalia saying that um, the, you follow the religion of your prince. But there's not actually a principled embrace of creed as a category between which groups should be neutral, or governments should be neutral, really until later in the 18th and 19th centuries. But one of the categories of credible neutrality became creed, and this is kind of weird, um, because beliefs seem more controllable than other categories, right? It's, it's a much bigger deal or more difficult challenge to change one's race, um, and many people believe that can't even be done, um, than to change one's beliefs. Another very curious feature about being neutral between creeds is that you can't be neutral between all of them because, and you shouldn't be, because some creeds are bad, whereas no races are bad, um, no genders or sexes are bad, but there are some beliefs that everybody agrees are bad. They disagree about which beliefs are bad, um, but everyone agrees that we can't treat every creed equally, uh, nor should we. So <clears throat> part of the difficulty with credible neutrality is this rapid expansion and the list of characteristics between which we must be neutral. <clears throat> so John Locke, of course, begins in the 17th century with a defense of religious toleration that will expand toleration to all Protestants, but not most Catholics, because Locke was worried that Catholics would sort of do uh, the bidding of uh, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, or atheists, because Locke thought atheists lacked enough incentive uh, to keep their promises because they didn't believe in an afterlife, an eternal reward or punishment. Now, of course, he wasn't the first to say this, but he was part of a very small minority of people that thought that states should be religiously neutral. But ultimately, with time, the boundaries of what we could now call viewpoint neutrality would expand to cover other Christian denominations. And then with further time, other theistic religions uh, like Judaism and Islam. Now, the inclusion of Jews as equals in the United States... <laughs> But even in the university system, took an absurdly long time, even though the U.S. has been better on this issue than just about every other country. Um, and, you know, so even including the other monotheistic religions <clears throat> is a relatively late development. And then as you get towards the end of the 20th century, the idea is that pretty much all religious perspectives um, are going to have to be treated as neutral. Now, we're still working or uh, interrogating the idea of being neutral between religion and the non-religious. Right now, for instance, um, our exemptions from generally applicable laws are given exclusively pretty much to 
uh, religious objectors, with the exception of the draft, where you can object uh, for non-religious reasons. <clears throat> so the late 20th century liberal philosopher John Rawls and then uh, Gerald Gauss, the sort of early 21st century uh, liberal uh, neutralist who, full disclosure, I'm a fan of because uh, Jerry was my dissertation advisor, um, they both defended a radical expansion of liberal neutrality to cover all kinds of ideals and what Rawls called comprehensive doctrines or theories of the good life, with the thought being, well, look, if we should be neutral between religions and ideologies are, and theories of the good life that are secular, they're, they're kind of like religions. And if we should be neutral between religions, we should be neutral between religions and other kinds of doctrines and ideals. And, you know, Rawls initially expands the group of tolerated characteristics or the group between which we should be viewpoint neutral as between both religions on the one hand or religious comprehensive doctrines, but also secular comprehensive doctrines like, for instance, a sort of uh, a comprehensive utilitarianism. These days, you might think, for instance, of a comprehensive doctrine being something like a, uh, being an effective altruist, right? A series of moral principles that are totally secular, but that have massive impacts on the way that people conduct themselves. And you might say, okay, maybe government shouldn't take sides on whether effective altruism is true or false. Government sh should try to be neutral, say, between their treatment of people of faith and effective altruists. Now, technically, you can combine those things, but for now, just allow me to distinguish between them because an overwhelming majority of effective altruists are secular. And Gauss tried to even expand this to economic ideology. So the state should try to not adopt a particular uh, economic view. They shouldn't sort of uh, raise the libertarian flag or the communist or socialist flag. So that's to give you a bit of an ideal of what liberal neutrality um, uh, is and, and its direction of expansion. And so we can see, I think, then the logic of liberal neutrality expanding uh, into neutrality between persons generally, regardless of what we might call their reasonable points of view. And I put reasonableness in quotes because uh, defining the bounds of acceptable beliefs is very difficult. And that's why law and philosophy have expanded piecemeal. As new people make, them make demands for inclusion, the circle of included perspectives is supposed to expand. And that range of beliefs, again, as I said, has tended to grow. Though the 21st century has seen regression in some ways for a problem that's actually very complex. And this is these are the questions raised by the LGBT movement. Because, um, for instance, American Christianity um, was able to take on anti-racist perspectives um, and able to internalize them such that now every major church at least pays lip service to the idea of opposing racism. Um, Gender equality, of course, has been a, a harder sell, as most Christian uh, churches do not ordain women. Um, but uh, particularly with respect to claims to LGBT equality, there's been uh, not just resistance, but resistance that often looks entirely conscientious um, and not simply, say, bigoted in some way. Um, and so there's this conflict where people who believe in equality or LGBT equality say, look, um, we're trying to create a safe, free, and equal environment for LGBT persons. Um, and that means that we need to, in some ways, limit what uh, religious conservatives can do or say in certain spaces in order to provide LGBT persons with the freedom and equality that they merit. And so in many circles, this has led to uh, a thought that we should, in some ways, restrict um, the speech or uh, the expression of people um, that don't affirm LGBT equality in order to protect LGBT persons. And so the thought is, as we've included LGBT perspectives, there's been this tension with whether we include religiously conservative perspectives, and we're still really figuring out as a culture how we're going to balance those perspectives, because neither of those communities um, are going away, um, and in my view, nor should they. <clears throat> so in the 21st century, the ideal of viewpoint neutrality has become controversial. Um, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, for instance, a lot more people were kind of on board. Um, but these days, in large part to forces kind of unleashed by the sexual revolution, many people have come to doubt it. People on the right say, look, you're, you don't treat religion or religious people as equals. And then people on the left say that viewpoint neutrality, for instance, has a kind of status quo bias on behalf of more powerful perspectives 
and excluding more marginalized perspectives. So the, the reason that neutrality is really important right now is this particular conflict that has arisen about disagreements about sexual orientation and gender identity and whether those disagreements are reasonable and whether people have particular views are somehow beyond the pale. So now we can move, um, you know, now again, that we have a sense of some of the challenges with liberal neutrality, we can move to credible neutrality. And <clears throat> here, the firms and DAOs have a kind of pragmatic reason to develop a doctrine of liberal neutrality. They don't want to give certain users special moral privilege because that just raises questions, right? We generally think people should be treated as equals if they're going to be treated unequally then we don't want to give users certain special privileges. And this leads both to resentment and unfair treatment, generating complaints and then to mistrust and people no longer using uh, the product. And expansive neutrality, again, is a difficult ideal because some views have to be excluded. Um, and as I'll mention in a moment, even in the technology space, certain views have to be excluded because if you allow any view, um, the sort of quality of the product degrades uh, rather quickly as you get things like bots and bigotry and so on. But remember that the fallibility of creators and governors is considerable. And the difficulty is that due to American political polarization and the phenomenon of sorting, where people uh, retreat into communities that agree, many people that operate these technologies um, just have no real contact with diverse perspectives, um, particularly religious perspectives, because they've grown up within uh, ideological bubbles, say with parents that are extremely economically and or intellectually successful that have prepared their children for uh, similar careers the whole way through. Uh, and that's been their parents kind of priority over, say, any kind of uh, training in spiritual matters. And so the, the difficulty is that many people in the tech space believe that they're neutral but they aren't sufficiently ex exposed to diverse perspectives to get a sense for when they really drop the ball and when they really mess up. Um, and there's, there's actually a pretty complicated reason for this, which is that a lot of these groups tend to have the kind of rarefied moral intuitions of what Joseph Henrich calls uh, weird persons, Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. So these are people that due to cultural evolution have developed a number of unique features that leads them to have different moral intuitions. And one of the big problems, say, with the replicability crisis in social psychology is that a great deal of the research that's been done has been done on American uh, and Western European undergraduates who tend to be weird, a capital weird, and that they have unusual moral judgments. And particularly as we learn more, for instance, about uh, the, uh, uh, the autistic brain, the autistic mind, we're recognizing neural diversity and the value of neurodiversity. Um, and so cultural and neurodiversity is going to mean moral diversity. There's going to be a huge range of moral opinion. And these aren't opinions that we want to blame people for holding because they're just sort of natural outputs of, uh, say, cultural and neurological mechanisms that I think are um, <clears throat> not blameworthy. Right? People come to certain moral beliefs in a non-culpable fashion. And so outlier moral cognition can often produce biased punishments. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. <clears throat> um, I could formally define, um, if you won't allow a philosopher to do this, um, but we could think about uh, neutrality in the broadest sense in the following way. We say something like, just a, <laughs> I know this is maybe a little silly to non-philosophers, but a being, that is some action that an agent takes, is neutral between person X and person Y concerning their differences D, if and only if the being does not treat X and Y differently on the basis of that difference. So just to fill this in, a judge is neutral between a Christian and a Muslim concerning their faiths, only if the judge does not rule differently in accordance with that faith. Just to give you a very clear example, um, we have uh, six, five, I guess, depending on how you classify Gorsuch, uh, uh, Catholic judges on the court, Supreme Court in the United States. And um, if one of them was to cite a papal encyclical in one of their decisions, we would think this is a serious failure of neutrality, right? I mean, we, we very much hold judges to this standard of being neutral. If someone were to say, look, um, I'm ruling this way because of, say, the Bible, um, we would think this was an outrage, right? And because the courts are supposed to make decisions, um, 
based on a kind of uh, criteria, neutral criteria, right? They're not supposed to take stances on the truth or falsity of a particular uh, religion. And for us, you could say affirm or Dao is neutral between group A and group B, or A, that is people who affirm doctrine A and people who affirm doctrine B, Aists and Bists, if and only if the firm's products uh, and processes do not treat Aists and Bists differently based on their doctrinal differences, right? So here we've expanded from a religious difference to just general uh, doctrinal differences. So hopefully this sort of clarifies what we're after. Now, how do we arrive at neutrality? That is, how do we ensure that a process is neutral? Well, it turns out in the history of the liberal tradition, there's been kind of two social technologies uh, that have been that have been used. And these were given the name name um, that they have uh, with a very important little book um, from many decades ago called Exit Voice and Loyalty by Albert Olof Horschman. And. Um, the thought was that an exit mechanism is one that allows people to leave institutions that they disagree with. You could leave as an employee because you don't like the policy, or you could just refuse to use uh, the product of a particular group, right? Um, so a very common example here is the general uh, boycott of uh, Chick-fil-A um, because of uh, leaderships um, uh, hewing to certain socially conservative views and donating uh, to really some really problematic uh, anti-LGBT organizations. So in this case, people have chosen to advance their values by exit, right? They say, okay, I'm not going to eat at Chick-fil-A. Voice technologies allow people to change institutions for the in from the inside. They can not just vote, but they can explain their reasons for their decisions. So people decide, well, look, I'm not going to exit the mechanism. I'm not going to exit the organization. I'm going to try to change the organization from the inside. Now, liberalism over its history has tended to stress both voice and exit. So liberalism, on the one hand, has pushed the idea of democracy, um, and that embodies the voice, right? People speak up, they give arguments for their views, whereas market transactions embody exit. And liberals have placed different levels of confidence in the effectiveness of this mecha these mechanisms. So a kind of chief disagreement between, say, libertarian liberals and progressive liberals is about whether we should use exit a whole lot. And so, say, use markets where people can just choose to buy or sell different products as they like. Um, and then progressive liberals who prefer voice, they think that democratic mechanisms are better, say, because they're less beholden to the profit motive or something along those lines. No need to take sides here just for you to understand that. The idea of neutrality can be reached either by people kind of segregating on their own, exiting particular uh, organizations that have different values or policies, but also voice um, by intervening and trying to make arguments. And so there's questions, you know, ways of reaching neutrality um, that are really quite different from one another. Now, in the kind of space that we're in, people prefer to use decentralized mechanisms. But as we know, uh, you can have a decentralized market but you can also have decentralized uh, decision-making and, and, and voting. Now, most of the tech audiences I engage with wonder, well, okay, well, why not just always use exit mechanisms, right? People don't have to argue. They don't have to have a discussion. They, they can just, you know, quietly leave, right? Um, if you don't agree with the views of an organization, you can start your own. And here the thought is, well, look, overall, you get something neutral. Each person can advance the values that they endorse in their own space. Uh, and that's a way of solving the problem of disagreement and diversity in a way uh, that's neutral because each group has its own way to proceed. So in the case of, say, cryptocurrencies, if you don't like the way one operates, you can engage in a fork. But network effects can sometimes make forking infeasible, right? Because the value of a particular product can be in proportion to how many users there are. So alter um, starting alternatives to Twitter are just very difficult. So consider Truth Social, which, you know, isn't going to go anywhere and would die immediately if Trump were not on it. Um, similarly, alternatives to Wikipedia, like the Conservapedia, um, it, you know, failed for similar reasons. And so the price of exiting these products is often too high. They're too valuable. Twitter's too valuable, say, for instance, to conservative activists. Um, and the result of this is that most of these organizations 
they allow for uh, exit, but they also use voice. And it's very hard to get around using voice. So let's think about it this way. Um, one of the, the features of, uh, say, the Vitalik's sort of uh, piece on credible neutrality is to not change the rules too much, right? If the rules are always in flux, then we aren't able to develop stable expectations. The one thing he doesn't get into very much is who gets to change the rules and why. And there has been some discussion, for instance, about governance tokens with respect to the blockchain, um, that ideally we used de decentralized exit and voice for governance. So the cool thing about decentralized voice is you can preserve equality. Um, although I don't actually know how governance tokens would work with respect to whether some can hold many more than others. Um, uh, nonetheless, in any democratic system, um, some voices are always louder than others for some reason. Um, but you try to avoid too much of that if you can. Another cool thing is that because it's decentralized, you can try to collect insights from groups that you may not be fully uh, familiar with. Um, you may have a perspective that's totally different from your own and produces a really shocking insight. But in almost every case, someone has to set the rules of engagement and a group of people have to figure out who gets to set the rules. All right. So um, and, and these issues are coming up as, for instance, cryptocurrencies become more mainstream and the mainstream uh, sort of economic and political norms begin to be applied to these technologies. People begin to make demands that these technologies follow the same kinds of moral rules that every other institution has to follow. And there are worries that the imposition of these moral rules will lead to centralized structures that will undermine what's attractive about these mechanisms. And so what, whoever the rule makers are, um, one thing that to be seriously committed to is a doctrine of credible neutrality in order to try to avoid getting sucked up into a particular, the United States incredibly toxic political culture, right? Which again, has been extremely costly uh, and consequential for Twitter. Um, and also, I think with time um, could be pretty disastrous uh, for Walt, for the for Disney. Um, but we will but we will see. Um, but right now they're in a bit of a they're in a bit of a hole um, because they can't satisfy everyone at the same time um, between uh, their employees, which are politically to the left of their consumers. And so uh, there's no real way for Disney to operate without severely. Uh, disappointing somebody. Um, and if there are ways that a lot of these new technologies can be credibly neutral, that's going to be very, very important for them to be able to function. Um, and so another problem is that people need to be able to understand how to actually implement uh, these technologies or implement the ideal of credible neutrality in these particular technologies. And that can be very difficult, especially if the people who are responsible for institutional design uh, have very little encounter with real viewpoint neutrality. So the cool thing about exit is that you don't have to make rules concerning what is neutral. Okay. So you can have a voice problem. Um, and it, when, when you can no longer use exit and that's it, you have to deal with deliberation. All right. You have to engage in exchange of reasons and arguments. You could just have a straight up and down vote and not exchange reasons at all. This is something that, for instance, Jean-Jacques Rousseau thought uh, could actually undermine democracy because people would influence each other's preferences. But today, most democratic theorists think the debate and discussion is good because it can help to transform preferences, change people's minds so as to reach more uh, consensus and a more rational consensus, one based on, as uh, the, the sort of great democratic theorist, German democratic theorist, Jürgen Habermas uh, is fond of saying, uh, the unforced force of the better argument. That, that'd be the idea. But discourse and decision require rules. And we want those rules to use, work for producers and consumers, right, uh, and users. And we also want to treat users equally, okay? So that's it's just general expectation. Now, these priorities can conflict, right? For instance, we've got different uh, theories of distributive justice or who should have more power. Some people stress merit. Other people stress equality. In the sort of uh, world of uh, market competition, uh, if you don't prioritize merit to a great degree, um, you uh, you can lose out pretty quickly. Um, although some of the documents that I was reading and preparing for this are suggesting ways to preserve equality and get merit at the same time. And I think that's a, that's a really uh, nice thing to do. 
Um, but one thing, for instance, I've been learning in my, my work with Confucianism is, is just how much more meritocratic uh, many East Asian cultures uh, are with respect uh, to equality um, that you find oftentimes more stressed uh, in the West. So the, the firm structures and operations uh, can work differently. Um, and so the thought is, yeah, you want to collect expertise. Um, you want to be able to make use of it, but you also want to treat uh, especially users uh, the same. So look, some people are going to have to have more power than others. There's no way to avoid it, but we also want equal treatment at the same time. We should also assume, I think, that most people, including um, governors or rule makers, want free discourse among diverse persons. You know, I've been reading lately and writing on people that are really actually opposed to free speech in principle. So these aren't just folks who think, well, some speech is harmful, but generally free speech is good. And we're talking about people who say, look, if you have free speech, people are going to end up with the wrong views and they end up with the wrong views. Uh, that's going to make the world worse. But I assume I think most of us at least want some degree of free discourse. So we want to solve problems while remaining neutral between those perspectives if we can. <clears throat> now, in uh, political philosophy, particularly the subfield that I'm in, there's two ways that people try to get discourse to be credibly neutral. You end up with two quite different models. The first I'll call consensus models. So traditionally, liberals have tried to restrict or privatize forms of diverse discourse that they see as threatening. This is particularly the, pro the problem of uh, religion in the public square. And in many cases that what uh, liberals have had a almost sort of it's almost genetic to the liberal tradition, which was that liberals first opposed both monarchy um, and particular arbitrary or non-constitutional monarchy and established religion. So one of the things, for instance, that many liberals did is they tried to either disestablish religion. So there wasn't a religion of state or in the case of England, water down the content of the Church of England so much that it can be a big tent. And in fact, of course, this is going on from at least uh, Elizabeth I um, all the way down uh, to uh, today, though, of course, uh, you may not know this, but I think roughly 3% of English uh, citizens are members of the Church of England. So they may have gotten so big tent that there's little content uh, to it at all and people became uninterested. Um, but there were many liberals, and this was common in the 70s, 80s and 90s, that said, look, um, you really don't want to bring your religion into politics. That's going to be irrational and scientific and divisive. Now, the totally weird thing about this was in the 40s, 50s and 60s, people were totally fine with this because you had a Christian left that was dominant instead of a Christian right. There really wasn't a Christian right of any significance in the 50s and the 60s. The religious left, the Christian left was much, much larger. And it's very easy to recall this. Right. So Martin Luther King is a member uh, was a member of the what you would think of as the Christian left. Right. And he would make religious arguments in the public square all the time. If you look at the fight against apartheid, Archbishop Desmond Tutu would make religious arguments all the time. Um, he would go to churches, Dutch Reformed churches, white churches, that is, that were committed to apartheid and make Christian arguments to them. Say, this is this is improper according to the Christian religion. But as religion became associated with the right for very complicated reasons, many liberals said, OK, it's better to keep religion out of politics. And there was enormous controversy about this uh, in the literature and in the broader public, which is the sense that um, secular liberals hated religion and that were biased against religion. And so they weren't credibly neutral. Now, the liberals themselves would say, hey, 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 we're neutral. We're just saying speak in terms of shared values or shared reasons, right? Um, and, and that's not a problem. That is, it, those are rules that apply to everyone. No one can bring in their private uh, commitments or private convictions. We have to speak in terms of what are called public reasons or shared reasons. But restrictions on speech, a few a few decades ago, you know, people were worried about religious speech, but today there's there's questions on social media about conservative speech have damaged the credibility of liberal commitments and tech company commitments to neutrality. Now, in my view, and a huge amount of my work has been avoiding or 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 attacking the privatization model of neutrality, because it doesn't end up actually being neutral, because there are some people that are happy to speak in terms of shared values. There are other people where their private convictions are extremely important to them, um, that they want to be able to express and act on those things. And it's also the case that we're learning that as people are able to express diverse points of view, 
Uh, democratic or discursive systems might make better decisions overall because you're able to appeal to unusual uh, insights. And most what we might call discourse companies, ones that are responsible for managing discourse, understand this to some degree. There's no real attempt to impose norms of privatization of the sort that liberals in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s really, really stressed. So you would frequently hear this on, on media, uh, particularly where um, uh, members of the Democratic Party would say, look, uh, religion is a, is, is a private matter. It's really, it's really a, it's a private matter. Um, that it's very intimate and important, and it, it's really something we should keep out of the public square entirely. But of course, um, for those of you who know about how religion in the public square is treated in France, we've got uh, the model of what's called laïcité, where, um, for instance, uh, there are restrictions in some cases of uh, women who, uh, Muslim women who wear uh, the, bur the burqa or a variety of related uh, forms of Muslim dress. Um, and the French say, look, we're just being secular and being secular is, is being neutral. Religion is a private matter. But I think most Americans think, okay, that's not actually neutral. That's not actually neutral. That's actually privileging the secular over the Islamic. And I actually think this applies to the consensus models generally, is that you end up privileging secular discourse over, say, diverse and religious discourse. And so what happened was, and this is ironic, right? The, the liberal neutrality was, was self-undermining, right? Because people say, let's be neutral by focusing on shared or secular considerations. And then the people who didn't like those considerations says, ah, you're not neutral at all. You're just opposed to religion. So I've been one of the people in the literature, um, a minor voice at best, but still nonetheless uh, loudly pushing for what I call convergence models. And convergence models reject all principles of deliberative restraint, with the exception of some really, really basic ones against, for instance, say, using racial epithets. Um, so convergence models treasure diverse discourse. They reject shared reasons requirement on discourse and discussion. But, and I'll use the term leftist here because in um, the, the sort of internet, there's an increasing decision to distinguish between liberals on the one hand and leftists on the other. So for instance, leftists would be, say, more influenced by uh, the socialist tradition, uh, perhaps not economic socialism, but a lot of other socialist ideas. Um, and um, they'll also uh, stress the downsides of certain kind of liberal principles like equality before the law um, or free, true freedom of speech, which they see as sort of cloaks uh, for the, uh, uh, the privileged, for the privileged. Now, the problem is that uh, pure convergence is not stable. Discourse will decay if you have no deliberative restraints at all, right? You have to at least have some kind of rules of uh, when people can speak or not. And of course, the convergence model I defend have this. But the worry is that weak users will feel marginalized and mistreated if you just allow the loudest voices to be the loudest voices, right? Um, but then you have restrictions that look like the tech overlords imposing their view. So it looks like, you know, many companies are sort of caught uh, and it's kind of uh, catch-22. And if you add in the political preferences of their shareholders or in other cases of their donors, then satisfying everyone just becomes impossible. Um, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't go for credible neutrality, but it just means we won't be able to realize it uh, entirely. Now, I think convergence discourse is better than consensus discourse for practical reasons. And it's for that reason that despite, say, liberals in the 70s, 80s, and 90s saying let's privatize religion, the tech companies, of course, haven't tried to do this uh, at all. They don't p uh, police religious speech, um, but they do police political speech. And it's very, it's a very, very fascinating why this is done. Um, because, of course, religious speech in the 17th century between Protestants and Catholics created the same kinds of reactions among people that you have now uh, with diverse ideological speech. Um, so, for instance, you have Protestants calling the Pope the Antichrist, which is as offensive to Catholics as, as some of the norms uh, that we have now on speech. So you avoid suppressing permissible speech. The risk is that you might suppress, might not suppress truly harmful speech if there is such a thing as harmful speech and offensive speech. So one thing that's happened as people have grown up on social media is that I find with my students are less likely to make a distinction between harms and offenses that many people will feel that because they're offended or hurt, that they've been harmed, that their interests have been set back in such a way to where for a long time, liberal philosophers would say, there's no such thing as harmful speech. But in the 21st century, there are many people who do think there is such a thing as harmful speech 
And oftentimes it's somehow going beyond offensive speech, though I do think there's been underdevelopment of the way in which offensive speech becomes harmful. Um, I think it's 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 it is hard to make that distinction. And of course, as one of my heroes, John Stuart Mill taught, you can never equate harms with offenses. If you do that, because people can be offended for all kinds of reasons, you just can't have free discourse. Someone's always going to be offended. So the question is, how do we separate out harmful from offensive speech? And in general, I think we should try to avoid um, making that distinction when we can. But of course, sometimes there's going to have to be rules of discourse for both practical and moral reasons. So here's a solution. Just want to propose this. Um, and, you know, of course, we can talk about whatever we like. Um, but I think the thought here, and maybe I think a lot of you will probably agree with this point, allow exit and forking where it is feasible, right? You don't have to trap people in systems. Why would you do that? Um, that doesn't seem like the right thing to do. Um, otherwise, you have pretty open convergence discourse because, of course, the, you know, so the tech world has not even begun to approach the consensus models. Uh, it just, I think, again, requires way too much policing um, to say, OK, you, you're not using shared reasons, you're using private reasons or whatever. Uh, and so there's been a kind of default to open uh, convergence uh, discourse. When restrictions on discourse and discussion become necessary, here's another thought. Review the imposed norms with a team with diverse values and beliefs, not just diverse non-belief features, noting and bearing in mind important differences in moral cognition that there is evidence piling up, just piling and piling up that uh, people's ways of making moral decisions are, are forming their moral beliefs can really be quite different from one another in a variety of ways. So in terms of forming diverse teams, there's evidence that diverse teams uh, can have a better decision making, but it's all too often that people, when they form diverse teams, are focused on non-belief features, as non-belief forms of diversity. And I think that's important for a variety of reasons. But all too often, we forget the importance of viewpoint neutrality. And what my suggestion is, is we try to honor these norms in general. Um, but it's going to be important that the norms that are imposed be imposed by those, by the consensus of those with diverse values and beliefs, and also that people are aware that diverse teams are making the choices. So if a new rule survives the scrutiny of a viewpoint diverse team, go ahead and try it out. Um, and then what you do um, is even if the rule fails, even if there's a backlash against the rule, people from diverse perspectives can understand that their views were represented, right? So you could say, oh, Facebook's you know, banned this particular group, but it was based on rules that were formulated by atheists, Buddhists, Confucian, Christians, Hindus, and so on, right? Between liberals and conservatives, between socialists and libertarians. And you may say, oh, they'll never agree. Well, that may be true. Um, but I think it's still worth forming viewpoint diverse teams to see if they can converge on common rules, because I think those rules are going to go down easier uh, for people, particularly if they feel like, well, the failure was accidental because they really did, the company really did, or, or the group really did consult uh, truly diverse uh, perspectives. So, you know, as, as, in the, as the Vitalik article says, uh, you have open source algorithms. You want people to see how they operate, but you also want to make open source the viewpoint makeup of the teams. Now, let me be very, very careful. OK, I'm not saying that people's names should be out there. That's a terrible idea. But just that it be clear that the people imposing the rules are viewpoint diverse. OK, and we already agree on the importance of. Uh, again, diverse non-belief features, but stressing uh, viewpoint diversity um, in the makeup of the teams, making the decisions, I think is going to be really, really, really uh, important. Um, and then, of course, you collect feedback and you update. You try not to change the rules too often. You can do, as many companies do, polling users on trust levels, um, which is going to be important as well. OK, um, so I didn't quite take all of our time, more than I thought. Uh, but that's really what I what I wanted to, to suggest. Just throw it out there, reject it, accept it, uh, ignore it. Um, but that was uh, just just a kind of thought, my way of thinking uh, about these particular issues. So, so thanks so much.